On primetime politics tonight, the latest on the Ottawa protests as the city of Ottawa issues a plea for 1,800 more officers to help take back the streets. And more questions are being raised about who's funding the protests and how much money's coming from outside the country. We'll hear from federal ministers and I'll speak with NDP leader Jagmeet Singh about the federal response. On a day when a judge issues an injunction forcing protesters to end the horn honking for at least the next 10 days. And our panel of press gallery journalists on the protests, the political splits, and the pending conservative leadership race. And we'll begin tonight with the ongoing protests here in Ottawa. It is day 11 of the standoff in the nation's capital and the crowd of protesters, it is much smaller than on the weekend. But those that do remain say they will not be pushed out and they'll continue to clog downtown streets with their vehicles and their pop-up shelters and kitchens. They have forced many businesses to close and promise they won't be leaving until all vaccine mandates and other pandemic health orders have been lifted. The Ottawa mayor has declared a state of emergency and has called on the provincial and federal governments to supply Ottawa with another 1,800 officers to deal with the protesters. Ottawa police say they're dismantling protest structures and trying to prevent supporters from resupplying the protesters with fuel and food, although there have been many images on social media again today of trucks being refueled. Police say they've handed out more than 500 tickets since Friday and arrested and charged 20 people. But the police chief continues to face questions about why these actions weren't taken earlier. And while millions in GoFundMe donations have been cut off to the protesters, they're now getting millions more in donations on different crowdfunding sites. Today, federal ministers responded to concerns about funding from outside the country supporting the protesters. It would be a terrible precedent to say that if you show up to the nation's capital with heavy equipment and blockade the capital city, that you can force reckless change in our public policy. It's been surprising that some who say they believe in law and order seem not to get this point. Casting a light on, on the source of funding that supports this illegal uh, activity taking place in our, in our country um, is useful for all Canadians to have a better understanding of what authorities are attempting to deal with. Well, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh and his party pressed for an emergency debate in the House of Commons on these protests, and Jagmeet Singh is with me now. Uh, Mr. Singh, uh, good to see you again. Uh, you believe Thanks. these protests uh, rise to the test and, and merit an emergency debate in Parliament. How come? Well, we've, uh, we've noticed a couple of things. This is not a normal protest. There's been a number of indicia that point to that. First off, a protest normally is focused on the government on raising concerns about a policy, a legislation where you pressure the government to change their decision. In this case, the brunt of the, of the impact of, this, of, this, of the presence of the convoy targets the citizens. The loudest noise, the fireworks, the honking are happening at night when no one is in parliament and it's, it is targeting families and kids and children. Uh, it, is, it has been the, one of the worst lockdowns for many small businesses since the entire pandemic, uh, the downtown core was set to open up mm. and were unable to do so. Many small businesses had to shut down because they couldn't get into the center. They couldn't leave. Right. And, In and, addition, and the organizers have made their, their goals really clear. They want to overthrow the government. They, they're not shy about it. It's clearly boldly declared on their website. They want to meet with the Senate and the governor general and dissolve parliament, replace it with an unelected committee. So for many reasons, this is uh, a problem. This is uh, targeting people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been hateful images. There's been uh, desecrating of monuments. And for many reasons, but including those, this is something that requires an emergency debate. The federal government today offered again, a number of ministers were out saying they're proposing a, a special meeting with provincial and municipal leaders to decide how to deal with the trucker protests. But it's also clear the federal government is standing by its position that, look, these protests are the jurisdiction and law of provincial and municipal government. So what's your response to that? I've, I've seen this discussion happen a lot of times and, and I have a very different perspective. Of course, uh, we understand that there are jurisdiction and there's constitutionality to that jurisdiction. But in a crisis, I believe, and I think people also would agree, shouldn't a leader be looking for how they can provide solutions instead of looking for excuses not to act? I don't believe it's sufficient to just say it's not our job, it's not our problem and do nothing. 
what Canadians are looking for is leadership. And there is always a way to find, uh, to help out. There's always a way for the federal government to provide leadership and support. And I, yeah. I reject the, the position that the, the federal government has taken, that they're just kind of standing back and waiting and seeing. I believe that a leader is someone who stands up. That's why I've said that prime minister has been missing in, in action. I understand that he, he has a positive test for COVID and one of his children as well. And I understand that's very stressful. But in this crisis, the prime minister needs to be there and the federal government needs to play an active role. And that's why we've called for this emergency debate right. to say, what are, the, what are the things that the federal government can do? How can we offer help well, with so, municipalities? How can we be proactive? So one of the things you did ask for that you are asking for is, is for, the, for the prime minister or federal leaders to, to sit down with provincial and municipal governments to decide how to deal with this. So they're offering to do that. Uh, what more? Uh, in addition to meeting specifically with municipalities, uh, we've also said that uh, we need to take a really strong stance against the political interference. Given that the goal of this convoy is to undermine the democracy, our position is that the government uh, has to travel, uh, find, attract the money and, and stop the flow of foreign interference into our democracy. That's a very serious uh, step that needs to be taken. Uh, we've also called for two additional steps. The third being we need to make sure that there's a plan. Canadians in general are frustrated. They're looking at uh, the fact that they're vaccinated, they've taken all the steps necessary, and still we're in this pandemic. So they want to know what the next steps are. What's the plan? How do we get out of this pandemic? What steps need to be achieved? If we're going to be living with the pandemic or living with COVID-19, what does that look like? What does that mean? Uh, we know that's going to involve vaccination, mm -hmm. maybe like a flu shot every year, and we have to keep on doing it. Uh, what about testing to keep uh, prevent the spread? And finally, what do we need to do to make sure our healthcare system is not always at the brink of collapse? How do we ensure that our healthcare system is resilient? That means making sure the federal government funds it appropriately, more nurses and more beds, so that we can move out of this period where we're constantly being a threat from a, a new wave that increases pressure on the healthcare system and threatens to overrun it. We can't be in that position anymore. You've, you've touched on concerns about uh, foreign interference in, in the support of these protests. Uh, what specifically are referring? To, are you referring to? What kind of an investigation do you want to see? Uh, well, what we've seen from the from the GoFundMe and from various uh, uh, Twitter kind of accounts is that there are a lot are of American politicians that are tweeting out support. A lot of Americans in general are tweeting out support. And uh, when we uh, evaluate, or when uh, different journalists evaluated the donations of the GoFundMe, they found that that a significant proportion were anonymous, and that there was a significant proportion of foreign donors. Now, donating to a cause in general is not a problem. But when that cause is expressly the goal of undermining the democratically elected government of Canada, and there is foreign money that's flowing to support that cause, that rises to the level of, uh, of, of serious political interference. And we've seen some columns in the Globe and Mail, or a column in particular, that supports that position. But this is deeply concerning, and, and we don't want foreign interference in our political system. Okay, there are, there are some on the other side who say, look, what's the difference between foreign entities funding uh, protesters in Ottawa and foreign groups funding environmental and climate protests that we've seen in Canada? Um, tell me about that. What, what, why is one okay and one not okay? Well, supporting any cause that, uh, whether it be environment or supporting a local hospital or a uh, Red Cross, if there's foreign money supporting those type of initiatives, it's very different from foreign money supporting a group who's clearly stated their goal is to overthrow the government. Uh, that rises to the level of foreign interference to undermine our democracy. And that's what, uh, that's what this convoy is all about. And again, so they're not being shy about it. They pretty boldly declare that on their website in their memorandum of understanding. So donating and, and foreign money going towards a cause whose stated intention is to overthrow the government rises to the level of political interference and is inappropriate. Uh, supporting an environmental cause or supporting an industry, uh, those things don't impact the, democ the, the demo democracy of our country the way this convoy clearly states their intention is. All right. Uh, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, uh, thanks for your perspective this evening. Uh, Mr. Singh, we'll talk to you again. Thanks so much. Well, residents in downtown Ottawa scored at least a partial victory against the protest today. An Ontario judge issued a 10-day injunction today to stop the protesters parked on city streets from incessantly honking the horns of their vehicles. 
The temporary injunction is part of a $10 million class action lawsuit against the protesters, launched by residents who say the non-stop honking has caused them irreparable harm. Emily Tammon is one of the lawyers who argued for the injunction. She is with me now. Uh, Ms. Tammon, thanks very much for taking time to speak with me. So you won your injunction, and, and I want to start by asking you for your thoughts on why it took a private citizen, a 21-year-old public servant, to launch a court case uh, you know, ag against these protests. Why, why wasn't this done by someone in government, someone in any level of government? Do you have any thoughts on that? I really can't answer that, Peter. I don't know. I mean, uh, we're hearing a lot of talk from elected officials and from the police service, but I just know that speaking to residents on the ground, they have felt really abandoned. They feel afraid to walk the streets of their own neighborhood. And, um, you know, we're just hopeful that this injunction will be another tool in the police's toolkit. And, you know, we understand we're hearing reports of uh, an infusion of resources coming. So hopefully that will remedy whatever the issue's been until now. So what exactly does this injunction compel the protesters to do when it comes to the honking of horns? So this requires, this is an order in joining all people in the downtown of Ottawa. So it's not limited to the um, the protesters per se. So it, it bans honking air horns or train horns, which are the main horns that we're hearing on the large vehicles, uh, anywhere within downtown north of the 417. Uh, it's important to understand that the injunction can only be enforced against people who have notice of it. So there'll be a lot of effort in the coming hours and days to make sure that we're disseminating this information as widely as possible. Um, in the media, it, we're hoping to have um, it published in newspapers and we'll be leafleting and doing everything that we can to make sure that the injunction is known as widely as possible. Right, because a, a conceivable defense for someone uh, who uh, uh, breaks the injunction would be, oh, I, I didn't know anything about it. But so saturation in the media, are you, I, I mean, we know, uh, you know, roughly where the, the protesters are located. Are, are you down to the ground level of trying to distribute the message out to them where they are? Absolutely. We were actually, uh, we had a team of volunteers out on the weekend disseminating to them leaflets in relation to an, a settlement offer that our client Sexy Lee had made, uh, inviting the truckers to leave Ottawa by 10 a.m. today, in which case she would release them from the lawsuit with uh, subject to court approval. Uh, and so we were out and a lot of them didn't realize that they could be personally on the hook in this lawsuit. So I think that was a worthwhile exercise. Um, I should also note that the named organizers that are defendants in the class action lawsuit have also been ordered as part of this injunction to post the injunction on their social media channels. Uh, so we're hopeful that, you know, through all of these different measures, uh, that notice will be widely disseminated, and then that'll make the injunction that much more enforceable. I want to come back to the, the wider lawsuit in just a moment, but how can this kind of injunction uh, uh, be enforced, and what are the consequences of ignoring it? So this is what's interesting, because while it's true that these excessive um, horn honking already was a bylaw offense, uh, a, a breach of this injunction would uh, constitute a civil contempt of court, and the full range of punishment is um, open to a judge finding a person in breach of this injunction order. So that means anything from a fine to up to and including imprisonment. So the 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 hammer, if I could put it that way, um, the threat of punishment is much, much um, more serious today, right now, than it was an hour ago. It is a temporary injunction for the next 10 days. Then what? So 10 days will be back in court. The reason it was limited to 10 days is because not all of the parties to the action uh, were given notice. Uh, we don't even know the identities of a lot of the truckers. And so the judge took the position that that makes it what's known as an ex parte application. So the law limits it to 10 days. Um, but we'll have a chance to return before the judge 10 days from now. And um, if there's reason to seek an extension of the injunction, that's something we can seek at that time. OK, look, you touched on it. The injunction is part of a wider class action suit claiming almost $10 million in damages. What's alleged in that class action lawsuit? Uh, so we're alleging that the um, most immediately affected residents have suffered emotional distress. They are at risk of uh, hearing loss, including permanent hearing loss and other conditions associated with them being exposed to such high levels of noise. Um, we are alleging that they've lost sleep. In some cases, they've incurred expenses because they've had to vacate their residences because it's become so intolerable to stay uh, at home. Uh, and then in addition to those damages for uh, mental suffering, uh, we're also seeking punitive damages be awarded against the defendant for the particular um, uh, organization. You know, it's, it's really important for people to understand, and this is what we'll hope to show in our, in our uh, lawsuit, is that 
the use of horns was a very um, specific and central tactic to this um, action. And so um, it'll be our view that, you know, this wasn't just, oh, unruly people honking their horns a bit, but that it was actually an orchestrated and very highly organized attempt to disrupt life for people in ways that has caused them actual harm. All right. Um, what was what was the argument from the other side about? Uh, I mean, was was the other side actively opposing uh, demands to stop the horn honking? They were, unfortunately. I mean, they took the position, for example, that people live downtown, they should expect to hear loud noise, that protests are a regular part of life in urban Ottawa. And we certainly don't dispute that. In fact, that's something that we should celebrate. Um, But, you know, our view is that these particular tactics and and I should I should point out, Peter, that, you know, in our application and in the injunction itself, we requested a term that makes it very clear that the injunction does not apply to peaceful protest. It really only we only targeted the horns because they're such an oppressive tactic that's being used here. Um, so, yeah, their position was that there's no irreparable harm. They deny that the horns are being honked at certain times, despite the fact that we've been able to show that they are. Um, and in their view, because of freedom of expression, they didn't feel it was appropriate for an injunction um, to be issued. But again, um, there's nothing in this injunction that prevents anyone from expressing themselves. All right. So it should be a lot quieter in downtown for the next 10 days unless there's a decision made to ignore uh, the injunction order. And so we'll see how things unfold. Emily Tamman, thanks so much for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm joined now by three members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery. Susan Delacourt's a columnist with the Toronto Star. Marika Walsh is a reporter with the Globe and Mail. And Joelle Denis Belavos is the Parliamentary Bureau Chief for La Presse. Good to see you all. Uh, Susan, look, let's, let's start by talking about these ongoing protests in Ottawa. The mayor of Ottawa is acknowledging his police force is exhausted and uh, is unable to end what he calls this insurrection, needs 1,800 more officers to clear out the protesters. Uh, federal government is offering more meetings and more support. What's your view of how this is being handled? I, it, there is a real mismatch here, um, you know, not just in the being outnumbered, but in the language they're talking. Right now, the, the protests are going on. They're admittedly more quiet and a little more into, under control than they were on the weekend. But we have a federal government and and all authorities that are responding with process mainly uh talk of you know jurisdictions and and orders and and logistics and um it's it's just it it, it feels like everybody's not reading the room properly and i you know from the protesters to the people responding that uh this feels a little more urgent than uh than talk of jurisdictions yeah marika what are your thoughts as uh, you watch this unfold Yeah, I think what I'm seeing is the province and the federal government keep it as far away from them or as arm's length as humanly possible while still seeming to be able to be responding, still seeming to care. The province and the Ottawa police can't even agree on how many OPP officers they actually have here right now. So I'm not sure that's invoking confidence in the citizens and the residents of Ottawa who are understandably and rightfully very frustrated. But I think Susan's right. There does not seem to be the urgency from the other levels of government. They really want to leave this at the feet of Ottawa to deal with by itself. Right. It raises lots of questions of of confidence, I think, doesn't it? I mean, look at, look at, we've had protests this past weekend in Winnipeg, Quebec City, Toronto, all of them Mm -hmm. uh, handled markedly differently uh, than the protest here in Ottawa. Uh, and I think people look at that and go, wait a minute, how, how come this is happening in my city and what's anybody going to do about it? Joel mm-hmm. Denis, uh, what do you see unfolding here? Well, I'd like to put myself in the shoes of a resident in downtown Ottawa, and I would say that they, 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 that they would seen... probably tra- they'd probably trade with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think so, yes. But I would say that the, the, the response so far from authorities have been insufficient and and. Not enough is being done to get to, you know this resu- this manu- uh, protest uh, done with, and so uh, it, it, there the level of uh, anger is rising uh, by the minute in downtown Ottawa, and I think it's being shared by a lot of people across the country. Why is it that Ottawa, the capital of the G7 country, cannot handle this properly? And I've talked to some cabinet ministers today, and they're floating some ideas that maybe we should extend the perimeter under the jurisdictions of the parliamentary protective uh, services wider than it is right now so that you wouldn't have any confusion over who has jurisdiction over what street in Ottawa to take control of this uh, protest. 
Uh, Susan, the other thing that's, that's now we're, we're hearing increasing talk about is, you know, the, a much wider debate being spurred by the protest over foreign interference and foreign funding of these protests. Thought it was interesting today. Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of Canada, uh, penned an op-ed in, uh, in Marika's paper in the Globe today writing that, you know, what's happening is sedition and that Canadian authorities should be looking at taking every step within the law to identify and thoroughly punish those involved. Uh, the involvement of foreign governments and any officials connected to them should be identified, exposed and addressed. What do you think of Mark Carney's intervention here, Susan? Uh, explosive, but I think it is the game changer in this whole thing. I think all of us watching TV over the weekend, um, those of us who were sort of attached to this thing, uh, were sort of stunned by seeing Ted Cruz, of all people, uh, supporting this convoy and and getting all huffy about the fact that Texans' money had gone toward it too. You know, this is this is something that we're going to have to address too. We we have lots of rules around foreign interference in our elections. We have lots of inf uh, rules around uh, foreign ownership of our media. But uh, the idea that Americans and you know even worse Trumpites. Uh, sort of sauntered into to bring their brand of populism here to our nation. I think this is a this is a game changing part of this debate. As is the whole uh, Marika, the whole way of fundraising. Now we know the protesters were cut off by GoFundMe, but now uh, there's a number of other sites raising funds, including the, the Christian crowdfunding site Give Send Go, uh, collecting almost I think at last check was five mm -hmm. million dollars in donations. Uh, how big of an issue is this going to be? Well, I mean, it's a bit like whack-a-mole, right? The Ottawa police cut off GoFundMe, <laughs> negotiate with them, and then all of a sudden another one comes up. I think it needs people need to be very careful when they're talking about what foreign funding they do support and don't support because lots of other mm -hmm. protests, lots of other charities in Canada do get foreign funding. So we need to be careful when we're talking about that. But I think all of this comes down to a question of how the police are going to handle it. The question of funding goes to how organized and how sort of entrenched and rooted this protest gets in Ottawa and how difficult it is to the police to deal with it. And it seems as though every time the police get one win, like GoFundMe, they don't get another. They don't get that next continual step. Yeah. Clearly, in terms of the communications, they're doing a better job explaining what they're doing. They're, they appear to be doing more enforcement. But the path out of this remains very unclear for the average person in Ottawa right now. And all kinds of things I think it raises real Denis about what happens next. So if they, when they do manage to clear it out, I mean, if you've got deep pockets with a, uh, an almost endless source of funds, uh, you could be looking at this scenario for uh, either in this city or other cities, but weekend after weekend after weekend. Absolutely. And I think uh, groups who would like to protest some government policies are taking some notes right now. How do you make sure that your protest is going on and on and you can have, have your message heard in Ottawa and even cause disruption to the city, to the core of the city in front of Parliament Hill? So obviously they will have to be in the top seat of, about this protest. What went wrong? And <laughs> not much went right, uh, obviously, because the city is not under control of by uh, authorities right now. And, and so make sure that this is not repeated because <laughs> this could become a, a, a regular mm. pattern in terms of protests that we can see in Ottawa. Uh, I'm sure that other groups are taking note right now. All right, uh, let, let's talk. I want to talk about one of the uh, uh, fairly active supporters of the protesters. Uh, this weekend, Pierre uh, Polyev confirmed he will seek the Conservative Party leadership, although he didn't actually say uh, or mention the name of his party. Instead, he announced he's running <laughs> to be Prime Minister to give Canadians back control of their lives. Here's a little taste of his social media announcement. Trudeau thinks he's your boss. He's got it backwards. You are the boss. That's why I'm running for Prime Minister, to put you back in charge of your life. Together, we will make Canadians the freest people on earth. All right, Susan, the race hasn't even officially started yet, but uh, some Conservatives would like, to, like a speedy contest with a Pierre Polyev coronation. Uh, what do you think the leadership race needs to be about? Uh, I think it needs to be about whether there is a viable conservative movement or whether we are back now in the 1990s where there were two strains of conservatism that couldn't live within one party. Um, I think that that is the immediate discussion for this too. On the issue of who's boss, I've been around politics for a long time. As long as I have been covering politics, I have heard politicians saying, 
the power should be with you, not in Ottawa. So he's playing the anti-Ottawa card as an Ottawa politician, as a, as a, a career politician. But, you know, um, shamelessness is not uh, a, a, an offense in politics. Uh, Marika, look, uh, you, you're, uh, we're, we're already seeing uh, conservative MPs line up behind uh, Pierre Polyev. Uh, a lot of people are talking about how this could be a coronation. W what do you think? Well, they certainly appear to be trying to make that the case, right? I think that the, the rollout that we saw this weekend from Pierre Polyev and his team, where virtually the vast majority of the caucus seemed to be supporting him within minutes of his announcement. You had people like John Baird coming out in his support. is designed to make him look unstoppable, unbeatable, to dissuade other people from entering the race. So it's clear that they don't want a competitive race. They want this to be as easy as possible. And that might be because of what happened with Peter McKay in the last race, where you know, the assumption around Ottawa, around political circles among conservatives was that Peter McKay would walk away with that. And then Aaron O'Toole came from behind. So, you know, I think a lot of people within the party want a healthy debate, want a competition to suss out and figure out those things that Susan was exactly talking about. Whether we'll get that when it's the third race in seven years, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, Joël Denis, let me, let me finish with you. A prominent Conservative MP from Quebec, Alain Reyes, quit as Quebec lieutenant over the par of the party over the weekend. Uh, he says he wants to engage in the leadership rate, no, not as a candidate, but to look for a candidate to get behind, to bring uh, a certain voice to, to the leadership race. Uh, what, what's he looking for and how is his decision connected to the candidacy of Pierre Poilievre? Well, it is directly connected to his candidacy, the candidacy of Pierre Poilievre. And Mr. Uh, Raya is, is very much active on the phone right now, trying to convince, namely, Jean Charest, the former Premier of Quebec, to run. So Mr. Charest is back in Canada after a trip in London, and he's supposed to meet with Mr. Raya to discuss the possible option of running. And Mr. Raya is convinced that he can bring uh, many of the Quebec MPs behind uh, uh, Jean Charest's candidacy. Uh, so, and so far, you have, haven't seen anybody, any MP from Quebec, supporting Pierre Poliev. They want to make sure that they push him in some direction, uh, forcing him to, uh, obviously, to say that uh, he will not uh, open, reopen the abortion debate, for example, or other social issues. They want some guarantees from him. And the strategy for Alain is to push him to make those statements very early up uh, in, uh, in a leadership race. Okay. Uh, listen, thank you all for your time tonight. Uh, lots to follow in, in all of your comments. Appreciate the time. We'll talk again soon. Take care. Thanks, thank guys. Bye. And that is all for this edition of Primetime Politics on CPAC. I'm Peter Van Dusen. From all of us here at CPAC, thanks for watching. Until next time, take care.